So now there is uh, the second talk of this afternoon that is uh, from uh, Maria Carla Piastra from Radium University of Donders Institute. And uh, Maria Carla will talk about a comprehensive study on electroencephalography and the magnetoencephalography sensitivity to cortical and subcortical sources. Yes, thanks a lot. Um, I will share Maria my Carla. screen. Okay. Yes. Do you see my screen now? No? Yes, I see. Great. Is there right. some noisy in, in background? Okay, or is, no, it's okay. Yeah, is it? I can okay. try to switch the microphone or is it okay? Now it's okay. Okay, I see. Then, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks a lot for inviting me to this uh, very nice workshop. Um, today, indeed, uh, I will talk about fan-based EEG and MEG sensitivity to cortical and subcortical sources. I am now at the Donders Institute, but this work was mainly done when I was uh, at the IBB uh, Institute for Biomagnetism and Biosignal Analysis in Münster in the group of Carson Walters, uh, in a project that was funded by the EU, the Child Brain. So this work has been published uh, last year, and um, I will start directly with giving some introduction. Um, even if generated by the same sources, we'll know that EEG and MEG signals differ and carry complementary information. Signal to noise ratio, SNR maps, are a good way to visualize EEG and MEG sensitivity. And they extend the knowledge about the modulation of EEG and MEG signals by source localization, lo location and orientation, and therefore can be of help to uh, better understand the, uh, the, the signal and uh, source of construction results. There's a lot of literature about EEG and MEG sensitivities and the expected SNR values, in particular in the work of Golden Olds from 2009. Um, they computed as SNR map for EEG and MEG using the boundary element method in uh, three compartment isotropic head models and they were dealing only with cortical sources. So in our study, the idea was to expand on the study of golden olds and to use highly detailed FEM head models, um, having up to uh, six compartment anisotropic head model, the one that also uh, Carson was uh, talking about this morning. And not only to focus on uh, cortical, but uh, also uh, subcortical sources. So the goals of our study were two. The first one is about the, the idea of uh, the wish to investigate the accuracy and the, the rea reliability of EEG and MEG finite element based sensitivity maps for three different um, head models, uh, from an isotropic three and four compartment uh, head model to an isotropic six compartment head model. We'll see details in a bit. And the second one is to um, examine and compare EEG and MEG uh, SNR mappings for both cortical and subcortical sources and their modulation by source location and orientation. Yeah, so uh, now we'll give an overview of the material and methods. The input data are MRI scans, sensors of EEG and MEG systems, and somatosensory evoked potential fields. Given the MRI scans, we are able to uh, build our head models and source models from the sensor. So um, um, merging information from the sensor and the uh, head and source model, we can simulate EEG and MEG signal. Having uh, real data, we can estimate the noise for the EEG and MEG system. And once we have the signal and the noise, we can construct our SNR map and then later on visualize some results in different ways for cortical and subcortical uh, results. So this is the general overview and I will give some details about kind of each color of this uh, map. We used uh, as input data um, anatomical and, um, uh, and functional data of one healthy subject. Um, as to the MRI scans, uh, we had a T1-weighted, T2-weighted MRI and the DTI. And uh, we recorded somatosensory evoked potential fields. And um, 
yeah, this is a, a picture, a figure representing the EEG and MEG sensor setup. We um, collected the data at the IBB in, in Münster, the uh, VU Münster, um, and um, the system that we had, uh, that we ha they have there, is an EasyCap 80 channel EEG system and CTF 275 XL gradimeters MEG system. Regarding the head models, uh, Carson extensively talked about how many possibilities we have to um, uh, provide and build a digital, digitalized version of a human head. Here we decided to construct three different head models, um, A, B, C. In A, we see a three compartment head model where we have an homogenized brain compartment, skull and CSF, and a skin compartment or scalp. In B, we see that we further refine the inner um, skull compartment, dividing the CSF, the, the liquid that is very conductive in our head, from the brain compartment. And in, the, in C, we see that we reached a uh, six-compartment six model, where uh, in the skull, uh, the spongy part was separated from the compact part, and the white and, white and, and gray matter uh, compartment were separated in the more general homogenized brain compartment in blue and yellow here. So this ended up, uh, we ended up with having a tetrahedron mesh with around 5 million elements and 900,000 nodes. The geometry is the same for every model, A, B, C. What is different is the, the labeling of uh, the elements and therefore also the connectivity values that are assigned for each compartment. Um, we use the, the DTI information uh, to uh, extrapolate and to estimate the anisotropic tensor for um, the white matter compartment. And we use the, the additional information given by the T2, T2 uh, weighted MRI to uh, distinguish between the spongy and compact part of the skull, which, um, as Carson uh, already extensively mentioned, it is very crucial in EEG uh, study work, can be crucial, yeah. Uh, this data, so the SCP, SCF, uh, uh, together with the tetrahedral mesh and the level set information regarding the same uh, subject, uh, are uh, available online in a bits format in the Zenodo portal. So you can just uh, download and uh, do your own research with that model. Um, yes, the second ingredient has to be modern in order to solve the EEG and MEG forward problem uh, are the source spaces. In this study, as already mentioned, we focus on the cortical uh, sources, but uh, uh, also on subcortical sources. So here on the left, we see the, the gray uh, white uh, matter um, or the, the gray mantle uh, that is, was extracted using FreeSurfer. And the, with uh, blue cones, I visualized uh, dipoles that were placed on the cortex and uh, had the uh, orientation um, radial to the surface of the cortex. And we ended up having around 300,000 um, 300, uh, sources, for both in the cortical and subcortical uh, example. A um, few words about the subcortical example. We are not dealing with the surface there. We, uh, we are dealing with volumes. So here we can see the nine different uh, subcortical uh, areas that has been identified by uh, FreeSurfer, the segmentation in FreeSurfer. And we decided to stick with those. And um, we used the, um, so we filled the whole volume with dipoles. And uh, in addition, since there is not surface, so the, the orientation of uh, deep sources is not um, constrained by um, radiality, for example, uh, what is the, that is the case for critical sources. Here we decided to consider the three Cartesian orientation for each dipole position and uh, each volumes in the subcortical areas. Yeah, this is just a slide, very messy slide, a slide or very crowded slide about the tools that uh, we use to generate the head and source models. So they are all completely uh, open source. There is not a pipeline. Um, I did not share the pipeline. I never. Uh, uh, had the, yeah, the chance to clean it up and share with the community, but um, uh, every, every component that I use for building the head and source model are um, open source from filter FSL, SPN12, FreeSurfer, ISO2Mesh, and MeshLab. 
Yeah, furthermore, I, I was uh, mentioning about the fact that we wanted to characterize the, um, the modulation given by uh, depth and uh, orientation of cortical sources to the SNR mappings. So we found a way to estimate the depth and orientation. Regarding the depth, uh, we compute for each type of, uh, in the um, cortical uh, mantle, we uh, computed the Euclidean distance with that position and uh, the inner the inner skull uh, compartment uh, layer boundary. And this is uh, on the right, we can see an histogram of the distribution of, uh, so on the y-axis, on the x-axis, we have the source depth and the y-axis is how many dipoles are uh, in that, in one of each five uh, of the five bins uh, identified here. So we see that the majority is within 20 millimeters from the, um, in the skull compartment. Regarding the orientation, well, we divided um, the source angle between uh, zero and 180 degrees. Here on the, on the right, we can see a rough estimation or, uh, yeah, schematization of uh, uh, piece of cortex. So this in, uh, in light gray, we can see a schematization of cortex. And therefore, I, um, I was uh, selecting some uh, position of dipoles and the relative uh, um, radial um, orientation of that dipole with the, within the cortex. So uh, we could um, divide all the sources um, by computing the, the, the inner product between the uh, the, orienta the radial orientation of that uh, dipole with the, the, uh, the, um, the orientation or the, the yeah the, the project the projected uh, vector in the um, inner skull compartment, and uh, so how to read this um, histogram here? We can read the we, we can see that um, dipoles that have a source angle in the in the center that are falling in the center bin can be considered tangential. The, um, the dipoles that are, um, have an angle in the first and the last beam can be seen as uh, radial, as also can be seen here in, the, in figure A. And in the yellow and uh, green uh, beams, uh, there are um, dipoles that have a mixed orientation, so between radial and the edge. And again, we can see that the, the majority of the, the sources uh, that we yeah, we selected from the cortical mantle, uh, they have um, a tangential orientation. Regarding the the, um, the orientation of subcortical sources, it, it is a more uh, difficult job because we know that in most of the subcortical regions there is no preferred orientation of the sources. And in general, uh, we can use the fact that uh, we know that radial sources do not contribute to the magnetic field measured outside of a sphere. Um, in realistically shaped head models, this fact still holds, but in a, an attenuated form that is um, almost equal to the fact of uh, considering the, um, the singular value of an MEG lead field and then um, associate the uh, weaker um, the weaker singular values and singular uh, vector to the radial orientation and the, the strongest contribution given to the or the strongest uh, singular values to the, the tangential orientation. So following Huang, uh, we performed uh, an SVD decomposition of the MEG lead field or MEG hover solution. And uh, we identified uh, radial and tangential components of the MG and subsequently uh, EG solution. So we computed and we, we um, projected the EG and MEG lead field accordingly to the radial and to tangential components of the solution. Regarding the EG and MEG forward solution, uh, we used um, Lagrangian FEM. So the CGFM, as uh, Carson, as, in order to, yeah, if we want to go on with the nomenclature that Carson would use it today, we used, uh, we applied a partial integration source model approach to deal with the singularity of the right hand side, as again Carson explained. And we applied a transfer matrix uh, method that is aiming at reducing the computational cost. We used, um, everything was computed and uh, the script that I used um, 
were uh, exploited the Geneuro software, which can be seen here at, uh, at this uh, website, uh, using the Python interface that Andreas Nussing especially was working on. And as uh, Carson already mentioned, um, we have a paper coming out is already uh, regarding the, the toolbox. Uh, we are already, there's already a, a preprint in um, archive and otherwise the, the paper is under review in the last one. And again, uh, one powerful detail about the Dineuro is that uh, we're aiming at including and embedding this code in um, uh, bigger toolboxes like uh, Filtrip and uh, brain, uh, Brainstorm, they're already uh, actually integrated, but uh, more testing is still needed. So we reached this point where uh, we exploit the MRI and sensor input uh, to generate um, EEG and MEG simulated signal. We can extract uh, from real data uh, an estimation of the noise and uh, having the signal and noise, we are ready to compute the SNR mapping. So um, for the SNR mappings, we uh, adopted the formula of SNR um, given by Goldenholz uh, et al. Um, what do we see here in this formula? Well, we have um, the source amplitude, AI, for each dipole I. We have the the number of sensors, uh, EEG or uh, MEG sensors. BKI is the power solution on sensor K given by the double I. And SK square is the noise variance on sensor K computed from real data. So one fixed value for each sensor. Given the SNR of, um, for each dipole, the SNR I of the MEG and the EG, we can compute the so-called differential SNR, which is simply the difference between the two mapping. Okay, uh, reaching the results section. So I will start, uh, the results are divided by, uh, in two. Um, there are the ones regarding the cortical sources and the ones regarding the subcortical. For the cortical sources, um, we could use uh, a nice visualization tool in the sense that we could just, um, color our um, gray mantle and the inflated version of the gray mantle on the on the right column uh, with the differential SNR, which now has been cut between minus 10 and 10 uh, decibel. First line represents the results of the differential SNR given by um, power solution when three compartments are used. The second line is about the four compartments and the third line is about the six compartments. So now, uh, so, and again, left column is the, the gray mantle, the cortical mantle, and on the left side, on the right side, there's the inflated version of the gray matter surface. So uh, if we zoom in and uh, briefly discuss uh, the differences between, I know maybe something else that I should say, so um, how do we read these uh, figures in general? The, the red in the figure represents the area where the MEG is more sensitive and in blue because, because of this uh, differential uh, SNR. So the positive values are where MEG is more sensitive and the negative values are where EG uh, is more sensitive. So um, yes. Uh, if we now focus on this comparison, we can see that there's yeah, uh, much more blue areas where the three compartment model is used. And these uh, areas are shrinked uh, notably uh, when uh, already four compartment, but also six compartment head model is used. And the other thing that we can notice is that, uh, so the MEG is more sensitive uh, or all in all when a six compartment head model or better to say that the EEG is overestimated, the sensitivity of EEG is overestimated where uh, when a three compartment model that is, a uh, that is a head model that is ignoring the CSF compartment is used. Another detail is that we can see um, that as expected, the EEG is more sensitive. Um, the DSNR uh, of the EG or the EG is more sensitive to uh, dipoles that are lying on the uh, gyro, gyro crowns and the uh, sulcal valleys where the orientation uh, is more radial, for example, here at this uh, 
top or in the values of the soil guide. And vice versa, we can see here in both examples that the MEG is more sensitive when the orientation, as, 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 as soon as the orientation is becoming more tangential, so in the sulci world. And another thing that we can notice from this comparison is that not only the areas where the MEG is more, uh, so there's more red in the six environment that model, but also the, the red intensity is higher, meaning that, especially in the frontal areas, and this can be due to the fact that there is a better coverage of the MEG sensor in the frontal area, in the front of the head. Regarding um, the modulation given by the source depth, here on the uh, upper uh, right corner, we can see as a reminder of the distribution of the, uh, of, is the histogram of the source depth and uh, yeah, in divided in five different beams. So we have again the five different beams here. Uh, this is a box plot. So we have source depth in the, in the X axis and in the Y axis we have the SNR values. Um, in the gray shades, we see the different results for um, EG SNR values uh, for different head models, three, four and six compartment head model. And in the red shades, we see uh, SNR values for the MEG when a three, four a five, and, and six uh, compartment are used. What we can see from this uh, graph is that uh, several things. So we can see that um, the EEG SNR values, so the, the green uh, box plots are mainly constant. So they are not really sensitive to the source depth. While for the uh, MEG, there's a, um, there's an expected decrease in uh, SNR values when uh, the sources uh, are getting more and more deep. The other thing that is uh, that we can notice is that uh, in the EEG case, the three compartment model is uh, clearly overestimating res uh, results, SNR results. So there's um, they're giving always a higher value when a three compartment model is used and uh, lower values uh, for a more realistically shaped uh, head model. Um, same, a similar thing for uh, the um, modulation given by the source angle. Again, here in the upper uh, right corner, we see the histogram of the source angles. And again, we see the same trend for um, the EEG results. So pretty constant throughout the, the, the angles. While we see kind of a growing and decreasing um, trend for the MEG results. And we have to remember that the central bin is uh, related to the tangential sources. So again, this is uh, something uh, that uh, makes sense to us. Uh, so the main thing is that from these two figures, we can see that uh, uh, while there's a modulation given by a different uh, volume conduction head model, so the accuracy of the volume conduction head model is um, modulating, is changing the results um, concerning EEG. This is not the case for the MEG, but vice versa. There is no modulation given by source or depth of the dipoles for the EEG results, while there is actually for the MEG uh, case. For the subcortical sources, we do not have the possibility to visualize uh, uh, as done for the cortical sources in, uh, in a surface because we have uh, volumes. So here we see again a box plot. Uh, on the x-axis there are all the nine uh, subcortical areas that we uh, uh, considered in our study where all the dipoles were put. And these are the results for the radial components. Uh, the, yeah, the radial S the SNR uh, given by radial dipoles. And as we expect, and also by construction, there is, um, there is um, a smaller SNR value, very uh, smaller for the MEG, uh, in the MEG case with respect to the uh, EEG case. But this is not actually the case when um, tangential deep sources are considered. So, uh, we um, here the, the range of the SNR values for EEG and MEG are, uh, is the same. And we also have cases like the cerebellum where MEG is even more uh, sensitive than EEG. Um, so this, um, this uh, is um, 
is a nice result, uh, giving more, um, yeah, confirming the fact that, uh, or um, a bit against the idea that uh, MEG is insensitive to um, um, deep sources. So uh, here now I want to uh, summarize the results. So uh, we can say that the three compartment model leads to overestimated EG SNR values for both cortical and subcortical sources. Uh, MEG is more sensitive than EEG in the majority, to the majority of cortical sources. We've seen indeed that the majority of the sources that are in the cortical layer um, are tangential. And MEG is not blind for deep tangential subcortical sources, as for example already shown in more um, practical um, work, um, and for example in the work of Parkhorn and where uh, auditory brains, their responses were uh, able to be detected by the MEG system. So in conclusion, we can say that uh, our guideline uh, could encourage brain researchers and clinicians to use combined EEG or MEG, uh, system, or uh, if a combination is not feasible, uh, um, the, the choice of either EEG and MEG uh, can be uh, selected based on um, our sensitivity maps. And in general, our results might guide the correct interpretation of neuroscientific and uh, neurodiagnostic applications such as EEG and MEG source localization, or in a reciprocal sense, TES and TMS sensor placement optimization. Talking a bit about the, the outlook, so the SNR maps that we created here could be combined uh, or could be uh, used to uh, weight the lithium matrices that are used in the source construction in EEG and MEG. This has already been uh, 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 yeah, uh, similar to what has been done in Fuchs and, and Moravchik, Moravchik uh, um, papers. We could create and study sensitivity maps for other uh, patients or uh, subjects like neonates, children, and patients with a, a big or small brain lesions. And we could study that with a different sensor configuration, for example, also uh, invasive methods like intracranial EEG sensors. Yeah, with this, um, I would like to thank my co-authors, my old group in Munster, uh, uh, with the, um, under the supervision of Carson Walters, Johannes Forber, Christian Amber, and Maureen Clerk from Iria. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thanks to you, Maria Carla. Thanks a lot. It was very, very, very interesting. Because it was impressive, the subcortical figure with image against image. So. We check if there is uh, some questions. Otherwise, I have some questions. One practical question is about, okay, uh, the software Juneuro is also in many Python or not up to now? No, not up to now, no. There is a okay. Python uh, wrapper, so one, okay. one doesn't need to use or to approach any C++ code. Uh, so the Python wrapper is, yeah, is, is making the okay. trick, so one should just deal with the Python. So I can use, uh, okay, with Python. I see a, a hand, okay. So please, I think you can mute. There is a math, yeah. Vanessa. Yeah. Yes, okay. Thank you. Um, I had a question about uh, different uh, number of compartment models in the subcortical results, where it yeah. seemed that the four compartment model for MEG was uh, doing best, um, especially Maybe. in subcortical areas. Maybe I will share again my screen and then we can look at the slide. You mean uh, here, for example? Yeah, yeah, this one and the previous slide as well, I think, where... Yeah, this is radial sources, and here are tangential sources. Mm -hmm. And especially for MEG, it seems that the four compartment model is, is working better than the three or six compartment model. And I was wondering what your take is on this, or whether the 
differences are just so small? Yeah, I think the differences are not uh, very significant. Uh, what we can see, for example, here for the, the radio sources is that indeed, um, yeah, there are the three compartment net model uh, is, um, is, um, is giving a lower uh, SNR values compared to the four and six. Uh, I also have to say that the, the number, so the median here uh, uh, is done um, over uh, less dipoles uh, than for the cerebellum, for example. So here, yeah, we did not decide to um, advance uh, like a, a hypothesis or a, like a theory around this behavior, I have to say. So to answer your question, I'm, I'm not sure if, uh, if this behavior is uh, particular, um, particularly relevant. It's also um, not very clear to me why the sixth compartment is uh, behaving uh, or is giving, um, yeah, in some cases the, the sixth compartment, the trend is broken. So there's not a linear trend, but uh, okay. it's coming up and down, yeah. But did you find some significant difference or not? I did not run any statistical okay. uh, proof. Uh, I used the word significant, but uh, uh, yeah, uh, without uh, really uh, yeah, checking statistically. Okay, thanks. I think we don't have time for other questions, but okay. We should not summarize that the four compartment model is the best. Uh, that would be a wrong summary from the results, I would say. Uh, no, no. No, it's not. Also because it's not the case uh, for, like, systematically, it's not uh, happening systematically for uh, every compartment. Yes, and it, it's, it, there is no a trend. No, uh, uh, no. Yeah. Only, yeah. only a last first question. Uh, did you consider also to take into account the DBA model? For example, where you consider the hippocampus not a volume, but a surface? Uh, um, no, so in the end, we decided to uh, uh, to apply the same model for all subcortical sources, even though okay. we know that uh, yeah, uh, a little bit more yeah, effort could be done to also the cerebellum uh, could be, yeah, um, um, the sources there could be uh, modeled uh, with a more accurate, in a more okay. accurate way. Okay, thanks a lot to Maria Carla, again. There was maybe Lauri with the, with the oh, hand, okay. but uh, maybe. The chat. Okay. I know, okay. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank well, you. I was raising my hand, but I, I don't think we have time for, for the question. Now, the, uh, okay, hi Lauri. Now there is the break, if uh, you wanted to. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. The yeah. break. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, congrats for the nice talk. I just wanted to um, sort of ask if your take would be that there is no point in going beyond a three compartment model for the deep sources in MEG. I mean, given the added complexity of, of uh, obtaining more fine-grained models than three compartment models. Yeah, so the, the, the idea with this uh, paper was to use the same to, to um, give tools or uh, we were working on the combined EG MEG modality. So once the, um, the head model is already prepared for the EEG for our computation, then we would just use the same model to go on with the MEG. But if, the only, of, if only the MEG modality is available, I indeed would not uh, recommend to uh, spend uh, much energy on uh, refining the, the, the head model until reaching a cis compartment model, especially um, uh, for a healthy subject. So if, uh, if a stroke patient would be under examination with a big uh, asymmetry in the brain, still I would say that it's important to model the CSF so uh, that could have an influence on the on the forward solution when there is a big asymmetry uh, given by a highly conductive medium like the CSF. But indeed, I would not go for a, a six compartment bond for the MEG. I don't know if Carson agree with that agrees with that, but uh, uh, yeah, that's Take not. what my <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Take not <laughs> because I think the deeper the sources, so especially for the deep sources. 
the contribution of the secondary currents is getting stronger. So let's say if the goal is really to use MEG, which is not the best modality for deep sources, surely, but if it is the goal, then using more sophisticated head modeling might make a difference. That would be my, that would be my, let's say, summary. The deeper the sources go, the more important the the uh, the secondary current contributions get, and and the more radial the sources also get. So it, it, let's say the signal is getting weaker and weaker and weaker. So you could also claim that then it also gets more and more important that you get more accurate. On the other side, you, you could also say if you only measure noise, then let's say you, you just can't re reconstruct anything. Yeah? Then it's a certain kind of giving up for two deep sources. But let's say your data set, Lauri, with the, the auditory click tones might be very interesting to see how different it is to, to, to let's say, to use a sophisticated six-compartment anisotropic head model if it makes a difference, especially to the orientation component, I would expect it makes a big difference if that counts. For example, if we want to stimulate afterwards and orientation is important, yeah. then I would expect that it makes a big difference. And, and for me, the sensitivity analysis of Maria Kada is the main result is if you are EEG person, don't ignore the CSF. It has a has a quite a strong contribution and it weakens the the sensitivity of EEG to sources in the brain because it, it smears out the current. That is our main result. I would not say that our results somehow point to what we can do for the subcortical. So which head model can be uh, might be the best for the deep sources. That I think our results are not sufficient to make a claim on that. Yeah, and of course the other thing is the localization accuracy and how that is impacted by the complexity of the model. So, yes. so you know, it seems that for the SNR, so the detectability, so there it doesn't really matter, but, but of course there's the localization, which is important too, so. Yeah, so I think we, yeah, uh, from, from what we showed, it's not clear. Uh, or uh, I would not say that um, uh, it's paying off the effort in building a six compartment net model for the MEG case alone I, I think from our study. We are color, they show that also MEG can see deeper sources. So there's not such yeah. a, it, it is not that the sources are not visible in the MEG any longer. No, no, but it's, this is shown independently from the level of accuracy that we use in the head model. So all in all three cases, all three cases deep, yes. deep tangential sources are also visible for the for also the MEG. Yeah, the, 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 the deep sources can be also seen in the MEG, at least in these simulations, independent of the of the details of the head. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Of the yeah. result, I would say. Yeah. Distinguishing between these three and six is let's say our results are not sufficient to, to make a claim. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Thanks. Okay. We're starting uh, some minutes with the new talk.